The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So let me first just remind you briefly what we did in last lecture, which was ages ago. Uh, um, so, so we um, say code, uncode, derived the, um, uh, derived the ADS duality. And then we also described a little bit the geometry of the antecedent space time. So there are two things I want you to remember about antecedent space time. He said there's two ways to think about it. One is so-called the Pankara patch. He said, say, we have a, a, a coordinate z or r. It depends on your choice. So, so for each cons z is equal to 0 at the boundary of ADS. So ADS have a boundary. It's the metric. Uh, 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 yeah, so uh, R square. So z goes from 0 to infinity. And z equal to, uh, uh, and z equal to 0, the, the overall prefect blows up. So, so the space time becomes bigger and bigger. So this is the, what we normally call the ADS boundary. And then when z becomes bigger, then you go to the interior. And then at each constant z, the space time is uh, foliated by Minkowski space say a d-dimensional Minkowski space. So this gives you a ds d plus 1. OK, so this gives you a ds d plus 1. And uh, so for each z nice, it's a ds space. So this is so-called the Poincare patch. And another way to think about ads is so-called the global ads. In the global ads, ads is just essentially a sort in the cylinder. And there's a time direction, which we call tau. And then there's a radial direction we call rho. And then there's some angular direction. And then the boundary of the surface, uh, uh, for example, you can write the, uh, 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 in this global case as 1 over, say, r square, cosine square, rho, say, minus dt square, plus d rho square, plus sine square, rho, d omega square, d minus 1 square. OK? And, then, and this row and then the angular direction is this omega d minus 1, so d tau square. OK? And then when rho goes to pi over 2, then the, again, the overall prefect blows up. So at the rho pi over 2, so this is the boundary. So the boundary here is S3 times r. So Sd minus 1 times the time. So it's just really a cylinder. So here, the boundary is the r1d uh, minus 1, just the Minkowski space time. OK? So this is two way uh, I want you to think about the antecedent space time. And also, um, um, yeah. So um, before we continue, do you have any questions? Yes? <coughs> You draw a cylinder, but the spatial part of that metric is not precisely a cylinder. Hmm? But, I mean, the spatial part of the metric is not precisely. Uh, you mean the boundary? No, I mean the, 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 the sine square rotor is a cylinder. Oh, I'm mean just saying the topology. I'm saying the topology is a, is a solid cylinder. Yeah, the topology is a solid cylinder. Uh, um, yeah. Any other questions? OK, good. So, um, so also, let me remind you the, uh, 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 this original de uh, 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 definition of the antecedent space time. So, antecedent space time can also be defined as a um, antecedent space time can also be defined as a hyperboloid. Hyperboloid in the d plus two dimensional Minkowski space time. OK. 
Okay, so this is the uh, 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 ADS d plus one can also be defined as hyperboloids in the d plus two dimensional Minkowski space time with two time. So it's a two comma uh, two comma d signature with two time. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit more about the, uh, so last time we talked about geometry of ADS, now we talk about a little bit the symmetries of ADS. So let's just further that discussion. D plus one dimensional ideas and had this either space time. So, um, so I assume all of you are, are, are familiar with the concept called isometry. Uh, if not, it's very easy to understand. So isometry refers to the class of coordinate transformations which leaves the metric invariant. Okay? And if it's uh, say if it's a Lorentzian, uh, if it's a Minkowski space time, then the isometry would be the Lorentz transformation plus the translations. Okay, so that's the isometries. And uh, so uh, for this ADS, by definition, the isometry would be S O d comma two, because this is hyperbolic for ADS because the uh, ADS is defined as a hyperboloid in this. Uh, uh, um, d plus two dimensional Minkowski space time with, with signature two comma d. Uh, uh, and this preserves the Lorentz, uh, uh, this hyperboloid uh, preserves the Lorentz transformation. So, uh, um, so the ADS, the symmetry will be SO d comma two. Just the Lorentz symmetry of this uh, uh, embedded Minkowski space time. There's no translation because, of the, because this equation breaks the translation, okay? Because this equation breaks the translation. So um, yeah, so you can see it immediately just from there. But what we will be useful later is to understand uh, how this is reflected in the so-called Poincaré patch. Okay. So let's talk about how this symmetry is realized in the Poincaré patch. Which I will use these z coordinates. Which I will use these z coordinates. So first, there are translations, which we can translate, say, x mu to some constant. So by x mu, I always refer to, uh, uh, using these uh, Poincaré coordinates, the x mu, I always refer to t uh, and the vector x. OK? So this is the. So first, uh, obvious, there's a translation in the t and x direction, because nothing depends on t and x. And uh, then there's also Lorentz transformation in the x direction. Because the, the dependence on the t and x is just a Minkowski metric, because each is foliated by a Minkowski metric. Okay? So, so this has d generators. So these have one half d times d minus 1. Because the, this is the Lorentz transformation in uh, in the d dimension, and then also there's a scaling. That this uh, uh, that metric is invariant under such a scaling. So if you scale x mu and z together, then clearly the metric does not change. So if you scale z and, the, uh, and x together, then, uh, then all the scaling cancels. Then, of course, this does not change the metric. OK? So, so there's also scaling. So this have one generator. So the last isometry in the, um, it's called special conformal transformation. The last symmetry of this uh, space uh, 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 which is called the spe uh, um, special conformal transformation is a little bit more complicated. Let me just first write it down, 
then I will try to give you some intuition about it. So the free parameter, so the parameter for this transformation are a vector b mu. OK? So, so I will introduce. So, so the transformation is the following. You, z equal to z prime equal to and x mu goes to x mu prime. So b mu is just an arbitrary constant vector, just constant vector. And uh, this a, uh, so b mu square, so b square is just the standard b mu, b mu. And uh, the a square is defined to be z square plus x mu, x mu. OK? So you can check yourself, requires a little bit of effort. You plug this transformation into this expression, and then you can show that this is invariant. Okay, so this have d uh, parameters because b, uh, so the free uh, so the transformation parameters uh, they are the d parameters, uh, so they are d parameters here. Okay, because of the b mu. So this uh, transformation can be understood in a slightly easier way, uh, as follows. Is uh, uh, as you uh, uh, will also do this in your p set. Is that you can check. So to understand that this, uh, 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 special conformal transformation, so I call the SCT. First, you can check the following is the isometry, uh, uh, something we call the inversion. Is that if z goes to z divided by a, so a is this quantity, or oh, a, I think I'm having some notation error myself. Um, so I should call it a, rather a square. So I, uh, uh, sorry, doesn't matter. I can also call it a square, but let me just call it a. I think that one would be a too. Yeah, that is a2. So yeah, I could just call everything a square, but it would uh, be consistent with my notation uh, on the loads. Just let me call it a. So, so you can also check that the following discrete transformation is also isometry. So when z go to z divided by a, and x mu goes to x mu divided by a. Okay? You can check this is isometry. So if you pl plug this into this uh, uh, metric, I, I, you find this leaves the metric invariant. And this thing is much easier to check. But as you will do in your p-set, and you can check yourself, this discrete transformation actually is not part of the SO d comma 2. It's in fact part of the O d comma 2. So, so if you calculate its determinant, say the Jacobian, actually you find the minus 1 rather than 1. Okay, So this is not. Uh, a proper uh, Lorentz transformation. It, it, it's not a proper transformation, what we normally call the proper transformation. But however, you can do the, uh, however, if you do this twice, then minus one times minus one equal to one, then you get the proper transformation. But of course, if you do this twice, you just go back to itself. You can check this is inverse of itself. So this is like a Z2 transformation. But you can do a slightly trick then you can show that this uh, uh, you can uh, you can show that this special conformal transformation is given by a inversion. You you first do an inversion, and then you followed by a, trans a translation in B mu, and then you invert it back. Okay, so even though you uh, you can check that i square is equal to one. But now, in the middle, you have added the translation in B mu, a constant. And this is a, a symmetry. And of course, the whole thing will be a symmetry. But now, this is a proper transformation because I have act i twice. Okay? 
but you cannot check this transformation is precisely. Uh, it, it, if you do this, it's precisely just that transformation. Okay. So if you add all them together, d one half d minus one uh, one d, then you can show actually they form this uh, asymmetry group. Okay, uh, they, uh, they form this symmetry group. So all together. You have d plus one half d times d minus one plus one plus d, then that give you one half d. You can check yourself that one half d plus one and d plus two, which is precise the number generated for the uh, uh, for that one. Okay. Yes. Uh, so the total here, the dimension is the d plus one. Yeah. But why, like, uh, even translation, it only has the d dimensional invariant? No, because the it, it, because this depends on z, so the translation in z is not invariant. Uh, okay. Yeah, so that's because this depends on z. Yeah. So uh, so you, uh, so if you translate z, uh, 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 this is not the isometry, and the metric changes. So only the translation in t and x is the symmetry. Yeah. So, so that's why we only do the translation x mu. I have a question. So yes. inversion is uh, uh, isometry. Yeah. Right? Yes. OK, so by inversion, as you said, it is not in the SLD2. Yeah, right. So that means the symmetry, uh, isometry group is bigger than SO. Yeah, yeah. It, it's the standard story. You have an O. Uh, you can have an O symmetry. Uh, 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 the, uh, there's a discrete part which is O. Uh, there's uh, 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 when you transformation you uh, uh, you uh, you change the Jacobian whether the Jacobian is one or minus one. Uh, it, 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 it just has a, it, it, exactly the standard of the uh, uh, the transformation in the Minkowski space time. In the Minkowski space time, you can also consider such transformations. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, just the same thing uh, because this is just the. Transformation in the Minkowski space time of this embedding space. So, so in the in the embedding metric, uh, we also have uh, like a more like a determinant minus one transformation. Exactly the same as the standard Minkowski space. Yeah. Uh, the discrete part just like a parish. No, no, it's not, it, 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 it depends. Um, in the yeah, in the um, in the order dimension, yeah, in in the in the in the three plus one dimension, just the parity. That's right. In the two plus one dimension, uh, if you invert all directions, then it's not, right? So yes. Uh, is there an easy way, an easy way to see the special conformal symmetry of the system? Hmm? Is there an easy way to see the symmetry from the, the metric? Yeah, you just plug this in. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I mean, how do you know that there is such a uh, complicated symmetry? No, let me just say, uh, a lot of way to understand is to do this one. So this inversion is a much simpler tra uh, transformation, which you can easily check its isometry. And then, and then this procedure will guarantee uh, 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 this is isometry. Be because, each step is, uh, because each step is isometry. Good? OK, so, so after talking about the, the so, so that concludes our very quick review about the geometry and the properties of anti space-time. Uh, maybe one more quick question. So since you said the isometry is bigger than SOD2, why are you only concern on the SOD2? No, it's the same thing. In Minkowski space, we can also separate the discrete transformations and consider the continuous part. Yeah, it's just exactly the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, certainly here, we can consider the inversion too. It's just uh, here, I'm considering the part which connects to the identity. Any other question? So is it true that in some dimensions, uh, the inversion is also isometry? Uh, I think, it, uh, uh, no, I think actually in all dimensions, this is not. Uh, oh, uh, in all dimensions, this is isometry. Uh, yeah, it's uh, inversion is always isometry in, in any dimension. So you just say the determinant is minus one. No, it's always minus one in any dimension. Other questions? Good. So after talk about the, the uh, under the space spacetime, now now we can talk a little bit about the, the string theory. 
in anti-digital space time. OK, we can talk about string theory. Now let's talk a little bit more about a uh, string theory and this is fine. Uh, uh, this discussion is very easy and essentially trivial because the, uh, uh, we know very little about the string theory and the disease of space time. <laughs> and uh, so there's not much to talk about. But, but there are a few general statements we can say. So there are a few general statements we can say. Uh, first, he said both ADS5 so we, s we have said that ADS5 is the maximally symmetric space of negative curvature. And we all know from your really uh, kindergarten years that S5 is the maximal symmetric space of positive curvature. So, so this combined together is really a maximally symmetric space, OK? So, so, so this A D is five times is five. A D is five times is five. It's a homogeneous space. Homogeneous. Homogeneous space time. Maximally symmetric homogeneous space time. So. So whatever string theory in this space, it's, so this space doesn't, uh, 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 so the only scale in this space is the curvature, curvature radius, and which is the same everywhere, okay? It's homogeneous, is the same everywhere. So essentially R, so this R would be just a single parameter to characterize the curvature of this space time. So single number which characterize uh, uh, the curvature of the space time. So if the space is not homogeneous, then you have to specify which place, which curvature, et cetera. But this is a maximally symmetric space, homogeneous. So, so single number captures uh, um, uh, uh, the curvature everywhere. So that means that in string theory uh, on, on this space time, it's really just characterized By the following dimension is parameter, so alpha prime divided by r square. Because alpha prime is a, is a dimensional parameter, but in the end, uh, it's uh, given by the uh, following dimension is parameter. And only for any physical process, can only this dimension is parameter uh, goes in, not separate of them, because there's no other scales. r is the only scale, and alpha prime is the only other scale. And so, so for any physics, the only dimension parameter can come in is this one. And of course, there's another dimension is parameter. It's the GS. It's what we call the string coupling. So, so essentially, the theory is specified by these two parameters. OK? Two parameters. And depending on what you want, you can also construct the Newton constant. The Newton constant can be expressed in terms of the GS and alpha prime. So, so in type 2B string, the relation so we are talking about type 2B string, the relation between the Newton constant and the, um, say, alpha prime and the GS is given by the following, given by the following. So, so instead of co uh, considering these two parameters, you can exchange GS by, by Newton constant. So you can alternatively consider Consider, say, gn to the r to the power 8 or alpha prime to the r square, OK? Or, or just characterized by these two dimensionless numbers. Uh, 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 up to your choice, uh, 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 sometimes this is more convenient and sometimes this is more convenient. So if you talk about string theory, work with the string theory path integral, et cetera, then this is more convenient. But if you think about the gravity, then the Newton constant appears naturally. And then, and then this become more, uh, 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 more natural, OK? So the fact that the theory is controlled by these two dimensions is parameters. But you say r is a, a constant r? Yeah, same r. It's just the curvature radius of the space time. And the whole space time is just, uh, just controlled by the single r. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, also, uh, 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 Implicit 
in my discussion here, which is in the metric I wrote last time, it said that the curvature radius here is exactly the same as uh, a curvature radius here. And so the single uh, curvature radius characterizes the whole thing, okay? Okay, good. So this means that whatever quantum gravitational theory or string theory in this space time, you can consider two limit based on this two dimension, this parameter. So first is so-called the classical gravity limit. So this is a limit which the string coupling goes to zero. So that means, uh, remember the string coupling uh, controls the, the, the loop corrections of the strings. And also, essentially, it's the fluctuation of the space time. And so the string coupling is zero. And also, the alpha prime divided by r squared goes to zero. OK? So this alpha prime divided by r squared goes to zero. So this is, can be considered as a point particle limit. Because alpha prime essentially characterizes so the size of a string. And when the, uh, the size of the string is much smaller than the curvature radius, and then, then essentially it's a point particle limit. So this is the standard classical gravity limit. So in this regime, we have classical gravity, and you cannot tell that those particles are strings. They're just not like ordinary particles. OK? So, so similarly, uh, uh, so, so g string to 0 can also be considered as the, the limit, the Newton constant go to 0. It's the same thing. OK? Same thing. And uh, so, so in this regime, you get uh, the super, uh, 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 classical gravity. And uh, uh, more specifically, in our case, we get type 2b supergravity. Which we, uh, which we briefly mentioned before. So there's another regime. It's called the classical string limit. In this case, the alpha prime divided by r squared can be arbitrary. Does not have to be small. So in this regime, then the string effect will be important. So you should be able, uh, uh, then, you, uh, uh, then that means that the, uh, that the space time curvature radius is comparable to the string size. Then, then in this case, you can no longer treat the string as a point particle. But, but we still take g string goes to 0. So, so that means that the quantum uh, fluctuation is small. Uh, 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 the space time uh, quantum fluctuation is small. OK, so this is. Uh, a, a, so in this case, you still have a classical theory, but it's a classical string theory rather than a classical gravity theory. OK? Any questions regarding this? So, so there's a lot of something else. Uh, so there's one feature in this space time. So this is altogether 10 dimensional space time. There's one feature of this space time is that the S5 is a compact space with a finite volume. And ADS5 is uncompact, OK? So normally, when you have a compact space, then it's convenient the S5 is compact. So it's actually convenient in such a situation to express whatever, say, 10-dimensional field in terms of uh, um, Yeah, it, 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 uh, maybe to uh, not express, uh, to expand. But 10 dimensional fields in terms of uh, harmonics in S5, OK? Because there's a discrete set of harmonics on S5, you can always expand some 10 dimensional field on it. So for example, if you have a scalar field, so suppose if you have a 10-dimensional scalar field, say we have x mu 
we have a z, so this is the ADS5 part, and then let me call it omega 5, uh, which is S5 part. Then you can always say, say you can expand the scalar field in terms of spherical harmonics on S5. Then what you get is you get the tower of field in ADS5. And then these are spring harmonics. In S5. Okay. And the it, in particular, in particular, when you do this expansion, then the higher harmonics, they will uh, develop a mass because of the curvature of the S5. Uh, uh, say so the lowest mode will be independent, say, of the coordinate on the S5, but the higher mode will depend on the coordinate on S5. And because of those dependence, because of the curvature of the S5, they will develop a mass. So, so the lowest mode will be massless, then they will uh, be followed by a tower of massive modes controlled by the size of ADS5, OK? So you can do this for any field, and in particular, the, uh, the metric. So when you do this, essentially, only the massless graviton in five dimension will mediate long range, say, gravitational interactions in, in ADS5. So, so, so essentially, so the gravity so, so at the known distance, the gravity is essentially five-dimensional, OK? OK. It's essentially five-dimensional, because you can always reduce on the S5. So there's a slightly tricky thing here, uh, uh, but it's only a, 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 a um, is that the size of S5, the curvature radius of S5, is actually the same as the curvature radius of ADS5. So there's not really a hierarchy here in terms of the curvature radius, uh, in terms of the curvature radius. But there's still an important difference that these have infinite volume, these only have a finite volume. So this is compact, this is uncompact, OK? But, but why the gravity hmm? but why the gravity doesn't say this thing is fine? No, it, it, because this thing is, uh, this is S5, but that's all. Uh, 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 but just as I said, this is a compact part. You can always do the reduction. And then the higher uh, graviton mode will develop a mass. Oh, okay. Yeah, we develop a mass. Yeah. Even though that mass is not very big. Yes. So if we apply this theory to the real world, then what would estimate for R? Sorry? What's the estimate of this radius? This curvature for if it should be compatible with our observational world? Swaffly size of the universe. But then doesn't it mean that uh, uh, we only should worry about the mass of this compact mode? Yeah. Only on distances much longer than R? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just saying. Uh, uh, at very large distance, essentially, it's five-dimensional. But uh, it, it's still, uh, uh, you can talk about the distance scale, et cetera. Uh, but here, R, R is the only scale. It doesn't matter how large it's R. Uh, everything is measured against R. R provided your units. Yes, but when we talk about distances shorter than R, then? Yeah, uh, it, if you talk about uh, distance shorter than R, it doesn't matter. It, it's like a 10-dimensional. Uh, it's like a 10-dimensional world. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but the ADS is uncompact. You can go at large distances you want. I, I'm just saying, uh, 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 the story is uh, slightly tricky because they have the same curvature radius. Uh, uh, but I'm trying to describe it in the spirit. And uh, also, mathematically, uh, you can always, uh, because S5 is uncompact, you can always do dimension reduction on it. And this provides a, a convenient way to organize fields in terms of five dimensional fields. Yeah. OK, so, so one thing we will often use is indeed just consider the dimensional reduction of the gravity to five dimension. Say if you have, say, say suppose this is the Einstein Hilbert action in 10D. So this is ADS5 part. This is the S5 part. 
say you have uh, some 10 dimensional so curvature so so r is a rich scalar in 10d okay now suppose the metric suppose let's consider the lowest modes for the metric which have low or uh, s5 dependence and then you can just reduce this to a five-dimensional theory, a gravity. So, so the volume of the S5 part will just factorize. Then you have a five-dimensional scalar. Okay? And this V5 is just the volume of S5. Okay, just volume of S5. And, uh, and now you can absorb this V5 into downstairs, then define an effective five dimension Newton constant. Five D Newton constant, uh, which I call G5, which is defined to be Gn divided by the volume of the five sphere. Okay? And the volume of the five sphere is essentially just pi cube. Okay, and, uh, and then of course there's r to the power fifth. So this is a quantity we will often use. Okay. So so after dimensional reduction, in the end you get a, 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 the action will have the form, fourteen pi g five. So five dimensional Newton constant, say D five X, just A D S part. And then you have the gravity part of the action, and then you plus many, many matter fields. So this is the essentially the uh, would be the structure uh, of your action when you do the uh, dimensional reduction. Okay? Shall we have uh, matter fields in the S five? No. You reduce everything on S5, and once you have done that, then, then S5 will disappear. But, but when we do, say, the R itself is a constant, so we can do the integral uh, easily in S5. But if you do have some uh, mass, yeah, you know, uh, matter so, term no, no, it, 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 no, it doesn't matter. So you can take, this is a standard story for Kluza Klein reduction, uh, a standard story when you do, expand around in this, so this will go into here, then the only dependence on the S5 part will depend on those things, then so you just can integrate those things. Oh. You can always integrate them. Okay. And, and they just give you some, uh, some, some, integral, uh, some numbers. They will just give you some numbers, and in the end you can always write action in terms of five dimensional uh, uh, action. But that, but that solution is a uh, classical solution for the Klein Golden equation. No, no, no. This is not a classical solution. I'm just doing an expansion. It's just like doing a Fourier transform. This is just expand oh. in terms, uh, in some basis. No, uh, I have not done anything. Uh, this is just a mathematical rewriting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. So if we insert that expression for G Newton into the effective, don't we have that this G5 is g squared alpha to the fourth divided r to the fifth. Why can't we reduce it to this alpha or r squared combination? Sorry, uh, 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 uh. We express g5 in terms of uh, gs and alpha prime. Yeah. And radius. Uh, why don't it look like only combinations of r prime over r squared and gs? Sorry, I don't understand what you're asking. No, G5 is a dimensional parameter. Five dimensional Newton constant have dimension three. So whatever dimension here, some of the dimension there will be compensated by R5, but you always have three dimension left. So this is a five, uh, so this is dimension three number. Yeah. Any other questions? Good. Okay, so, so then this concludes our discussion about string theory in ADS5 times S5. So, as I said, there's not much to talk about it. And uh, so now let's uh, look at the other object, which is the N equal to super Yang Mill theory, which is the, uh, uh, the other side of the equation, of the duality equation. 
Okay. So in this case, we have a lot to talk about it. We, in principle, have a lot to talk about it, but we won't have time. So we will also not talk much about it. So, so we are only mention a few essential things. Okay. So the field content, say, of an incompatible super Yamil theory, which we already learned, which we already learned from the uh, from the low energy theory on the D3 brain, is that you should have a gauge field, and then you have a six scalar field corresponding to six transverse direction over the D3 brain. Okay, you have six uh, uh, scalar fields. And then, when you include the supersymmetry, et cetera, uh, when you, uh, in the super string, uh, uh, then they're actually also the massless uh, 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 fermions. So, so, in f so this is three plus one dimension, okay? So this is three plus one dimension. So see in three uh, plus one dimension, you can represent the, the uh, uh, fermions co uh, conveniently by two components, for example, two components of wild fermions. Then, then it turns out that there are four such wild f fermions. So A will go to one, two, four. So alpha is a s spinner indices, and A just label different spinners. So altogether, you have four spinners. Okay. And so this is essentially the field content uh, of the input for super Yang Mill theory. So we would not worry about the uh, we will not worry about the fermions. So, uh, but but I'm just making it here for complete this. So if you have a UN gauge theory, if you have a UN gauge theory, say for the ND3 brain, then all this, all this field is in the, uh, uh, the general representation, in the general representation of UN. In other words, each of them is a N by N matrix. It's N by N permission matrix. Okay. Uh, uh, so each of them can be represented by n by n Hermitian matrices. So all together, yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, so uh, so let me not write it. Uh, uh, let me just say it in words. So all together, you have eight on shell. You have eight bosonic degrees freedom, because for the photon, you have two. For a photon, you have two uh, uh, unshared degrees freedom, and here, six scalar field, you have eight unshared degrees freedom. And for the fermion, you can also count that the four wild spinners uh, actually have eight uh, 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 unshared degrees freedom. So, so, each of, so, so altogether, you have eight n square, because each of them is an n by n matrix, so you have eight n square, say, unshared bosonic degrees freedom, and eight n square fermionic uh, uh, unshared degrees freedom. Okay? For the um, uh, why we have eight, eight fermions? Hmm? We have eight fermions. No, we have four fermions, but each fermion have some spinner component. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Where does the number come from? Sorry. Where is it four fermions? Uh, uh, that come from a calculation. This I cannot explain here. Uh, 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 this I can only quote this fact. It, it, it just if you work out the theory on the D3 brain, turns out there's four wild fermions. Uh, 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 which we did not go through that because we did not do super stream. Yeah. So this comes from the fact that it's we're being a super symmetric theory? Yeah, it, it, it's come from the super symmetry. Yeah, come from string theory, super string theory. So we only, so in our discussion, we only discussed the bosonic part. We, did not, uh, 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 we never had time to discuss the fermionic part, etc. So, so let me now mention one important point, which I think is, I hope is self-obvious, self-evident to you, is that this UN, actually there's a U1 which decouples, which U1 decouples, just, uh, 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 actually let me just write down uh, 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 the Yamil theory first. So let me write down the Yamil theory first. So, so, so you can write down the Yamil theory which we uh, uh, actually wrote it down before. The boson uh, uh, let me only write down the bosonic part. Bosonic part. So essentially just given by Yang Mills coupling. Trace.
And this is uh, the, a covariant derivative acting on the scalar, standard covariant derivatives. And the i and the j are all su uh, summed, OK? So i and j are all summed. So this is the Lagrangian, then plus the fermionic part. So this is the bosonic part, then plus the fermionic part, OK? Yes? Are fermions coupled to phi fields? Yeah, they're all coupled. They're all coupled. How do, how do they couple? It's standard you couple coupling. Um, yeah, so the key is that they coupled through a particular coupling. The whole thing, you just can to have a single coupling. In principle, uh, if you have so many fields, you can have many, many different possible couplings. You can have one coupling between them, uh, uh, one coupling between them, etc. You can have different couplings, but uh, and the self couplings, etc. And uh, and the key of Inkovo Subayamil theory is that every coupling, they they equal uh, up to some constant, uh, uh, up to some constant factors, uh, uh, which is precisely give you the supersymmetry. Anyway, so. So I think it's obvious to you that if you have a UN Yamil theory, that the U1 part always decouples, uh, U1 part uh, decouples, OK? OK, U1 part decouples. Uh, uh, so a UN, you can always decompose it into SUN times u1, and the u1 part corresponding to, so each a, I, I, each field is n by n matrix, and the u1 part is the part which is proportional to the identity matrix, and the sun part is the part which, are propor uh, which is given by uh, n by n uh, a traceless matrix, and uh, so the u1 part is uh, 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 proportional to the identity matrix. So, but you can immediately see from here anything which is proportional to the identity matrix, all the commutators will vanish. Okay? So essentially U1 part is a free theory. So U1 part is a free theory. Okay, U1 part is a free theory. Um, yeah, if this is not clear to you, you can easily uh, convince yourself afterwards. Um, And this is also very, this is also physically clear from the point of view, thinking that this is coming from the D brains. Coming from the D brain, you have essentially have N D brain together. And uh, this, this Yamil theory essentially describes the low energy dynamics of the D brains, so how all these N D brains interact with each other. But no matter how, they, how complicated they interact with each other, there's always a center of mass motion does not depend on their, their internal structure. And that center of mass motion essentially is just this U1. And that center of mass motion always decouples, OK? So, so U1 decouples. And you can also check from here that U1 decouples, OK? Good? So now let me, so the interacting part is just SUN, OK? So in the, uh, the interacting part is just SUN. So now let me say a few words regarding the properties of a theory. So first, is that this theory has an equal to four supersymmetry. So this is another important remark. This is just explain the name. Uh, 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 just explain the name. So in supersymmetric series, say you have a transformation between boson and fermion. Okay, you uh, you have some uh, the series invariant on the transformation between boson and fermion. So under such a transformation, the conserved charge. Is, uh, uh, so for such a transformation, then you have uh, lost a charge. For such a uh, 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 transformation, the loss of charge 
uh, can be described by a spinner, okay? Can be described by a spinner. So normally we say n equal to one supersymmetry if the supercharge is given by a single wild spinner in four dimension. So n equal to four means, we, means that the total number uh, of such conserved charge is actually given by the four wild, wild spinners in the four dimension. So it doesn't matter, just, uh, uh, so these have a number of supersymmetries, okay? And, uh, and also, uh, if you lower a little bit supersymmetry, then this is actually the maximally allowed supersymmetry in four dimensions for remolizable field theory. Okay, so this is actually maximally allowed supersymmetry. But this will not be important for us, okay? But this will be, but the next point will be very important for us. Is that because of this theory is so symmetric, that this G, uh, uh, so G Young Mills coupling, its dimension is classically, okay, it's a, a, because this is a four dimension, uh, and the, uh, the Young Mills coupling's dimension is classically. And the same thing with our own QCD, our own QCD coupling's dimension is cl uh, classically. But the quantum mechanically, then the coupling actually changes with the scale, okay, because of the quantum corrections, et cetera. So generic coupling changes with scale. But 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 N equal to four super Yamil theory is special. That this actually this Yamil's coupling does not change with the scale, even at the quantum level. So, so at the quantum level, this remains the dimension is coupling. So so using the technical term. For those of you who have studied the QC, uh, uh, Young Mill theory, is that the beta function at the quantum mechanical level, the beta function for G Young Mills is actually zero. That you can, which means you can really treat this G Young Mills as a parameter as a dimension is parameter. Even quantum mechanically, okay? Even quantum mechanically. So, so this is a genuine parameter. In contrast, in our QCD, there's no, par, uh, there's no such parameter. Okay, in QCD, we only have a scale. There's no parameter. Good. Any questions regarding this? Uh, I you said you would know the coupling, uh, non nonlinear coupling, has a bad function as a symptomatical free. Yeah. Uh, but that means it's not that interesting. No, it's not. Uh, no. In the, in the, in QCD, the Young Mills coupling is not a parameter, it's not the dimension is parameter. It translates into a scale. Yeah. It translates into a scale. So it, it translates into a mass scale. Yes, but can we uh, find a massless parameter in the standard world like this? No, because the beta function is non-zero there. Yeah, yeah, because the beta function is non-zero there. Okay, and also because of this, the beta function is zero. The the theory is actually conformally invariant. Theory is actually conformally invariant, okay? So which we normally call, say, it's a conformal field theory. We call it a CFT, okay? So one way to understand this is that because the theory, uh, 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 because the, uh, the beta function is zero, essentially the theory does not have a scale. So theory classically scale invariant, the quantum mechanical remains scale invariant. And then you can show that it actually is a, a little bit more general, it's conformally invariant. So let me say a little bit uh, uh, about the, uh, so are people familiar with the concept of the conformally invariant or conformal? No. no, okay. Yeah, so let me say a few words about the conformal. 
So conformal environment means that the theory is environment under the conformal transformations, okay? So let me say a few words on the conformal transformations. So conformal transformations are the following. Say, say suppose your space-time metric is given by some g mu mu. So the conformal transformations are those coordinate transformations. Okay, you go from x to x prime. So that under such a transformation, your matrix, the transform of the matrix, is related to the original one only by an overall scale factor. Okay? Only by an overall scale factor. So if lambda is equal to 1, then this is what we call the earlier isometry, which leaves the metric invariant, would be isometry. And if you uh, 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 leave the metric invariant up to your overall scale factor, then this is called the conformal uh, 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 transformation. Okay? And for the Minkowski space time, for Minkowski space time, actually I can just e even use this thing here. Yeah, yeah maybe let me. Um, yeah, let me uh, erase here. Um, so, so for Minkowski space time, say if the g mu mu is equal to eta mu mu, suppose this is a d dimensional Minkowski space time. Okay? Then you can show. You can just work out, solve this equation, work out all possible such transformations, okay? And uh, you can show that conformal transformations are the following. First, they are the standard isometry, which is the translation, because the translation does not uh, give you lambda 1. And then you have a Lorentz transformation, which also gives you lambda 1, okay? And then you can have a scaling. Of course, if you scale your coordinate by some factor, then, then, then of course, the metric will only change by overall factor. So this is the translation. So this is the Lorentz symmetry. And this is scaling. And then we also have something what we call special conformal transformation. Special conformal transformation. So this is for okay. And the B again is some constant parameter. Okay? And also for the discrete transformation, also you can have a discrete. Also you can have a discrete transformation uh, uh, inversion. You said x prime mu equal to x mu divided by x squared. Okay. So these are the, all the, uh, 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 the, uh, the transformations in general dimension, which li leave your metric invariant, leave the Minkowski metric invariant up to your, up to your overall factor. And the conformal invariant theory is a theory which, trans uh, which is in those transformations. Okay. And uh, so, so obviously, a, a, a Yamil theory uh, are always invariant on the translation and the Lorentz transformation. But when the beta function is zero, the system does not have a scale, then it's then invariant on the scaling. But typically, in general, uh, four-dimensional theory, uh, uh, any theory invariant on the scaling is also invariant on the special conformal transformations. So, uh, so actually, the uh, for super yamil theory is actually a conformal theory. Okay, conformal invariant theory. So now, as part of your P set, you can actually see that these conformal transformations, in fact, have one 
to run correspondence with this uh, 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 isometries of, uh, 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 of the ADS. Okay? And this, uh, we will see later, this is a part, uh, an important part of the relation between the ADS. Uh, 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 this is an important uh, uh, part of this duality relation, is that the symmetry have to be the same. Okay? So, so, so you compare the two, you can see that indeed they're one to one correspond to each other. So, so the full symmetry, so the conformal transformation add together give you SOD comma two, okay? Uh, so this is the conformal group. So for the conformal group in D dimension, in D dimension, then you get uh, the SO comma two, okay? And but in this theory, there's actually also global symmetry because the the inclusive superior theory come from the D3 brain, which is a transverse space is a rotational invariant. So so there's actually a SO6 symmetry translate uh, uh, rotate a different phi i uh, phi i's. So 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 actually there's also a global uh, uh, SO6 symmetry. Uh, which rotates phi i, okay, and the fermions, okay, and fermions. And then when you include in the supersymmetry, when you include in the supersymmetry, Then you get a huge uh, uh, symmetry group. It's normally called a superconformal symmetry. Anyway, uh, uh, let me just write some uh, some notation down. It doesn't matter. So if you include the symmetry, the full symmetry group is what we normally call. Uh, so this is a supergroup. So SU two comma two four doesn't matter. So the bottom line, the bottom line, is that the inclusive super Yamil theory is the most symmetric. Four-dimensional theory, okay? Uh, and almost, uh, no series more uh, has more symmetries than, than, than inclusive force of the Mill series. Any questions? Yes? Uh, so, so how do we know those are all possible? So you can classify it by solving this equation. You can classify it by solving this equation. Uh, what's uh, two, two, four, right? No, no, this is just a notation. Yeah. Any other questions? So I can say a few words about the, the conformal field series. Um, but, uh, um, but it's getting a little bit... Um, Nate, and I want to talk about other things. So, um, so let me just say it in words. Uh, say it in words, and then you can try to read it uh, in other places. Because even if I just write a couple of formulas here, it still won't change you very much. I won't teach you too much. Um, so, so important thing about this uh, um, conformal field theory is that the uh, each operator. Say each local operator, uh, 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 yeah, you can classify local operators by how they transform, say, under these conformal symmetries, and then you can associate, say, a dimension to each operator uh, 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 related to how they transform in these uh, um, uh, conformal transformations, and uh, and then you can also show that the symmetry actually dictates the two-point function and the three-point function of such operators. And essentially, the structure of the two-point function and three-point function are completely fixed, okay? And, uh, 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 but not higher point function, but only two and three-point functions. Um, yeah, so that's essentially it. Um, not much known, I, I, many things are known about conformal field theory in one plus one dimension. And about higher dimensions, uh, um, 
yeah, other than what I said, not much, uh, uh, not too much more is known. Yeah. So any questions regarding this? Okay, so let me just summarize, then we can have a break. So we can summarize. So let me just summarize what we have done so far. And also with the important refinement, with the important refinement. So what we said is we started with two pictures. One is deep brain with some open strings, and then some closed strings can interact with it. And then when we go to the low energy limit, then we get an inequality for super Yamil theory. When we get an inequality for super Yamil theory, with, now I say SUN plus a decoupled U1, and then plus what we discussed last time, a decoupled uh, the gravitons, okay? in the low energy limit. So let me just write E equal to zero limit. On the other side, we have this pure geometric picture of the curved space time produced by those deep brains. So those curved space time at infinity behaves like just 10 dimensional Minkowski space time. And then when you go to the close to the brain, then the space de uh, deforms into the ADS5 times AS5. Okay? Form into ADS5 times AS5. And uh, under the low energy limit, corresponding to, we uh, consider string theory in, in the uh, very much down uh, uh, this throat. Okay? And the low, so the low energy limit is the string theory. So when here, when you take e equal to zero, we get string theory in ADS5 times S5, then plus decouple the graviton, here also, here, when we look at the, the uh, geometry of the brain, essentially we have fixed the location of the brain. So essentially we have fixed the center of mass motion. But in principle, you can allow also the, the, uh, 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 the brain to move anywhere. So, so here, essentially there's also a decoupled center of mass motion, okay? So now let's, also, get rid, let's get rid of this decoupled graviton. Let's get rid, get rid of this decoupled U1 or decoupled center of mass motion. Then what we get is the fully interacting part, okay? The fully interacting part. So the fully interacting part is a small refinement than what we said last time. Is that an inequality for super Yamil 3 with gauge group SUN should be the same as the tab 2B screen in ADS5 times S5. Okay? So now I emphasize now this is SUN. And more precisely, this is uh, uh, ADS5, uh, uh, S5 in this Poincare patch. Okay? In the Poincare patch. Yes? It, and just to recall, is the, the N comes from the amount of flux on the S5, is that correct? That's right, that's right. So, so the N here, uh, uh, related to the uh, flux on the ADS5, it's also uh, related as uh, um, uh, we will see, uh, um, related to the Newton constant, et cetera. Yeah, we will see that, yeah. Okay, so, so now we can look at this geometric picture Okay, we can look at this geometric picture. Then we observe something interesting. So, uh, so with this UN group, let me say on R one comma three, okay? 
on the three uh, uh, plus one dimensional. And let me write it better. This S U M on the space on the Minkowski space R one comma three. So now let's note, make a simple observation based on the geometry of ADS. It says this R one comma three is actually the boundary of ADS five. Okay, it's essentially the boundary manifold of ADS five. And the right hand side, no matter whether you do field theory or string theory, you can always do dimensional reduction on S5. You can always decompose everything on S5 in terms of harmonics. So essentially, the right hand side, because S5 is a compact space, the right hand side is a five dimensional gravity theory. Okay. So we actually now here see a five dimensional gravity theory now lives on now it's equivalent to a four dimensional theory lives on its boundary. Okay? So so this really can be considered as a realization of holographic principle. So, so actually, there are two ways to think about it. One way is to think from this. Uh, 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 one way. So previously, we motivated. Long time ago, we motivated the uh, duality using two perspective. Uh, one is the holographic principle, that the, some gravity theory should be equivalent to the theory living on this boundary, and also be uh, also be also motivated that the that the Yamil theory in the, uh, in the gauge group SUN or UN, when you do the large N expansion, then behaves like a string theory. Okay? So this can also be considered as an explicit example of that relation, that uh, this is a Yamil theory, and then turned out to be equivalent to a string theory. Okay? So, so now if you look at this statement, you say, is this a coincidence? Because I don't really see, somehow, in this picture, not so much, somehow, how, why this uh, Yamil theory uh, uh, is actually, should be considered as living on the boundary of ADS5 times S5. Because the boundary of ADS5 times S5, somewhere around here, so I don't see some Yamil theory living on there, OK? So, so is this really just some coincidence that just happened to be uh, 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 that? But actually, there's a very important prediction one can make. If you take this point of view, if you take this point of view, now I can erase here. Maybe I will do it here. Um, yeah, but if you take this point of view, then there's a very important prediction you can make. Then there's a very important prediction you can make and then check whether that has any chance of working. So if you believe this picture, then we can have a long trivial prediction. Because ADS also have a lot of description in terms of the global ADS. So let's say what happens if we put the string theory in this global ADS, which, you, which certainly we should be able to do, because these two are only differ by some global structure, okay? And, and this is one part of that, uh, they only differ by some global structure. So if this is really true, if this is not a coincidence, then we can make a long trivial uh, prediction. It said A equal to four, it said type to B string in global, ADS5 times S5. So now, 
uh, the ADS5 we take to be the global to take to be the cylinder, that should be equal to the Inks for Super Yamil theory, which now should live on the boundary of that cylinder, which is on S3 times R. OK? So this realization will give you a powerful prediction, which in principle you can check. OK? And, uh, and of course, if this is a coincidence, then there's no reason why this to be true. Because from the brain point of view, we cannot really do the, uh, do the sphere. OK? So any questions about this? So when we derive the right hand picture, we impose that there is some charge on the deep right. But in the left hand side, it seems that we never require the charge on the deep right. No. Uh, uh, the charge is just reflected in the open screen dynamics. OK. So by the right hand side, we don't have the charge. No, the, uh, you essentially have a charge, but, uh, but in that description, you don't need to introduce that charge. Uh, whatever but charge. If we impose charge, the left hand side will never be changed. No, no, no. It, 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 just left hand side, you just talk about the strings. Uh -huh. You don't talk about the whatever charge. The charge is a gravity description. Uh -huh. uh, the charge doesn't even arise in this picture. I just have some strings, I have some open strings, I have some closed strings, they interact with each other. Okay. And this picture goes to low energy, it will appear as a charge of the super Yamiosa theory. No, 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 no. Uh, this goes in is just super Yamil theory. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Yes. True. Yeah, this is true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, um, 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 yeah. Uh, 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 so that means this is not a, 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 a fantasy. Yeah. This tells that this is a fantasy. This is actually a powerful realization. Uh, this is a powerful realization. Yeah. So, so let me before conclude, uh, uh, um, let me just quickly mention uh, uh, something just in terms of semantics. So I always say type to be string in ADS five times S five. So you may ask, does this make sense to say such things? Because if we think this is really as a quantum gravitational theory. So if you have a finite string coupling, then, then everything fluctuates. And then, uh, and then, then why we specify a rigid space time here, OK? Why we uh, specify a rigid space time here? Uh, 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 uh. So, so the way you should understand the statement is the following. You said, indeed, if you say consider the finite G Newton or finite G string, then the space time can fluctuate a lot. We'll, we'll typically, we'll deviate from a this phi to this phi. But this ADS5 times ADS5 specifies is asymptotic geometry of ADS. Okay, it's asymptotic geometry. It's, it, 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 it's the uh, geometry uh, uh, of ADS uh, uh, very far away near the boundary, and essentially this can be considered as specifying the boundary condition for gravity in uh, 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 the boundary condition for the quantum gravity. Yeah, uh, so this essentially specifies the boundary condition. Good. So, so let's have a couple minutes break. Then we will talk more about the duality. OK, good. So let's start again. So now let's move to a new chapter. So now I have established the duality. So let's try to understand the duality. So let me call it the duality toolbox. And then we can try to use it. <coughs> then we can try to use it. So, so first, let me uh, say some general aspect of the duality. <coughs> oh, I erase. Oh, I should keep that figure there. Uh, anyway, um, so the first important. Thing is so called IR UV connection. So, 
So here we see the equivalence, say from the ADF5 gravity, say we have some ADF5 gravity to go to ink for super young mill theory. In, in d equal to four. So from this direction, we may consider as a realization of the holographic principle. Okay? We can consider this direction as a holographic principle. And then you may ask, from the field perspective, if we think from this uh, angle, why somehow this description of the field theory have one more dimension. So this is a four-dimensional theory, this is a five-dimensional theory, okay? What does this actual dimension does? What does this x dimension do, okay? Uh, 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 how do we understand from the field theory perspective uh, somehow this increase of one dimension, okay? So the answer turns out, the answer is actually very simple and it's already nice in the way, uh, the answer is already in the way which we take the low energy limits, okay? So remember when we take the low energy limits, uh, so let me draw this figure again, uh, in the gravity side, and this is going to R goes to zero, okay? So by studying the right shift due to the curved space time, we show that if you want to go to low energies, then you want to go to smaller and smaller r, okay? So you want to go to smaller and smaller r if you want to go to low, low and lower energies, okay? So smaller r, and then give you smaller energy. <laughs> so we use this argument to decouple this, the other factor, we say, if you want to go to low energy, take R go to zero limit, then there are infinite distance between them. But the nice thing about infinity is that uh, uh, after you go to infinity, there's still infinite left, okay? So, in the, so the same argument also applies in the ADS, in the, in the ADS part, uh, after you decouple the other stuff, and the ADS part, this argument still applies. Still the same thing happens. If you, uh, the same, uh, a blue shift, uh, same red shift argument applies. Say so if you want to go to lower energies, you want to go to smaller r, okay? And so this immediately tells us that this extra dimension, this r direction, is precisely the direction which external to the ink force of yang theory, transverse to the ink force of yang theory. So this immediately tells us this extra dimension, this r, or, or in this coordinate z, remember in this z, z just related to, uh, uh, z related to that thing just by r squared divided by r, okay? Uh, is the, uh, 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 that r related to that z. So that the r goes to zero limit, it tells you that the r dimension, r can be considered, this extra dimension can be considered as representing, representing the energy scale. Of the Yamil theory, okay? Or the energy scale of the boundary theory. Say so if you want to go to low energy, you go down farther slope. Okay, this is a very, very important uh, uh, point. And, uh, and this nice into many phenomena between ADS and the CFT and this connection, uh, 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 very important. Uh, and if you have a good understanding, it will give you lots of good intuitions in, in understanding the relation. So, so let me just to elaborate uh, the argument again now using, the, uh, 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 using this metric, okay? Okay, so I, uh, now I will go over this redshift argument again and, uh, and uh, 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 to use this metric, okay? So, um, so again, so the key thing is that the x mu 
which t go to x appear in this metric is the uh, is the defined in the boundary unit. Okay. So this defines. So this defined in the boundary unit. So, uh, so this is the unit we use in the uh, in the Yang Mill theory. Okay. So those coordinates are defined in the boundary unit. So but now if we to want to talk about the energies in some buck, say say the local proper time and the uh, and the lens and the total pro uh, proper lens at some say at some z, okay, say at some location z in the bark is related by 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 the standard relation which we can read from there. You say d tau should be equal to r. So this local proper time, local proper time should be equal to r divided by z dt. And the DL, so the local lens scale, should be a proper lens should be related RZ times DX. Okay? Okay, just because of this, uh, uh, you can just read it from here. Uh, 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 and locally, you can always write it this as a Minkowski metric in D plus one dimension. And then, and then for the local observer, and this is the local time, local proper time, local proper lens. Okay, and then this tells you. Then you can easily invert this relation. This tells you the the, the energy we observe in the Yang Mill theory, which is the energy we measure in terms of t, should be related to the energy which we measure locally through this relation. Local energy and uh, the and the length scale, say now d in Yang Mill theory is related to the local then scale by this relation, okay? So this is the inverse of that because of the tau and the energy. This is just the same as that, okay? Good. So now let's consider the same Bach process, okay? So let's consider the same Bach process. Say, for example, the process we are sitting in this classroom, say suppose we live in ADS, let's imagine that happens at different values of z, okay? Say for the same Bach process, At different z, okay. Then of course the e local, the local energy scale, and the local length scale would be the same. Okay. So if we consider the different process at different z, uh, uh, the same physical process at different z. In terms of a local observers, it's the same. So E local and the e, D local does not change, OK? But if you translate into the yang uh, uh, scale, then you find now that the corresponding the yang energy scale now proportional to 1 over Z, OK? Because now we have fixed E local. Okay, we have fixed the local. Uh, we are changing z. So, so now you find at a different location now corresponding to different energy scale in the Yang Mills theory. Say the d Yang Mills will be proportional to z. Okay, and in particular. In particular. For the same process, as z equal to zero, 
If we move this process close to the boundary, z equal to 0 means close to the boundary, then the Yamil's energy, the corresponding Yamil's energy actually goes to infinity. And the corresponding Yamil scale actually goes, uh, distance scale goes to 0. So that means this is mapped to some UV process in the Yamil theory. OK? And uh, but if you take z goes to zero infinity, which means you go to interior far away from the boundary, they go to infinity, far away from the boundary, go to interior, then, then this E Yamil's, then the corresponding Yamil's energy scale will go to zero. And, uh, and the, uh, the corresponding Yamil's length scale will go to infinity. OK? So this would correspond to the IR process. So this would be a low energy process and a large distance in the Yamil theory. So that would correspond to the IR process in the Yamils. OK? And this, so normally, if you think about the perspective from ADS point of view, when you go to the, go to the boundary, means you go to long distance. So from ADS point of view, this is uh, going to the IR. OK? And when you go to the infinity, z go to infinity, you are going to the interior in the box. So roughly, uh, it's not precisely heuristic. You can think this is actually going to the short distance in the, in, not really the short distance, just, yeah, this name is not very proper, but let's just call it UV. Just going to the interior of the, the box. So now you seem to see an opposite process going on. In the ADS, we go to IR. Then from the Yamil theory, corresponding to the uh, going to the UV. But the, in the, in the uh, 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 ADS, you go to interior. And then from Yamil theory, corresponding to you go to the IR low energy. OK? So, so here, we have something like IR-UV connection. OK? In particular, yeah, I, I already said in, in particular ones. Um, so, <laughs> so, but I don't have other words. So in particular, <laughs> if you really consider the typical gravity process, OK? So, so if you consider the typical gra uh, gravity process, then not consider string theory, just uh, consider gravity. Typical gravity process, a classical gravity process. Then essentially the curvature radius is, it, it defines your scale, OK? So that means that the typical gravity process is the E local is of order one of the curvature scale. And the typical length scale in the bar, you can see that it's also the curvature radius. So in these cases, if you plug this into this relation, then you can see that for the typical Bach process, you can really identify the e Yang mills essentially just with the radial direction. OK, because of the, uh, this, pro, uh, uh, this product will be 1. Uh, uh, this product will be uh, of order 1. And then, then you can really just identify uh, 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 the z the inverse z with the Yang Mills energy, OK? So, so let me just say this in, the, in a little bit slightly uh, a pic, uh, 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 in, the, in the picture. Yeah, uh, maybe I do it here. Or, uh, maybe just do it here. So, so s s think about uh, uh, this in the picture. So this, suppose this is a boundary. So this is the, uh, uh, the picture. Uh, this is the um, this is the picture which on the back page of the class it said if you can see the some process here which we draw a cow, which I don't know how to draw a cow here, <laughs> and uh, and uh, at some distance say here, some value of z here, and the similar process at some other value of z, then the corresponding boundary image of them. So this will correspond to a bigger guy, and this guy will correspond to a slightly small guy. Okay, 
Yeah, I, I hope you understand the picture. Yes, yeah, so the further away, the same process in the interior, they correspond to uh, a process with a larger distance and a low energy from the from the field theory perspective. Okay, uh, from field theory perspective. So now let me make some remarks. It, 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 yeah, I did not draw it very well. Did this clear what, uh, what I mean by this picture? OK, good. Yeah, uh, a more fancy picture is just in the web page of the class. Um, so now let me make some remarks. The first remarks is that the ADS, if you say calculate the volume of ADS, they calculate the uh, determinant of this guy, square root of the determinant of the matrix, and then integrate over the whole space, then you find it's uh, divergent. And in particular, it's divergent because of uh, uh, the infinite distance in going to the, uh, in going to the boundary, OK? So often, we will, say, put some cutoff, IR cutoff, near the boundary, say rather than let z go all the way to z equal to 0, we say we stop the space at z equal to some epsilon. OK? Uh, as that's the procedure we will often do, uh, uh, just as a mathematical convenience. Because if you go all the way to z equal to 0, then this factor blows up, and then, and then many things become uh, uh, tricky to do. And then, then we, of, uh, we often, in order to get the finite answer, we always put the z put the boundary at the z equal to some epsilon, and epsilon is some small parameter, OK? So, and for example, this is what you will do in your p-set, in one of the p-set problem, OK, when we try to, uh, 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 when, when you will check this holographic bound, uh, and that's the trick you will need to use. So, so putting the IR, putting the IR cut off, In ADS, at some z equal to epsilon, then from this RUV picture, then translate in the boundary, in the boundary, we introduce a short distance cutoff or UV cutoff. say, at some short distance scale, say data x, say of all the epsilon, or, or energy cutoff, or UV energy cutoff, at, say, energy, say, uh, of all the one of epsilon, OK? Or the one of epsilon. So this is just a lateral. Uh, 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 the reason this corresponding to a, a UV cutoff because because of this relation, because of this relation, when you cut off the space at some f uh, uh, z, then you can no longer go to infinite energy. You can no longer go to infinite uh, distance scale. Okay, and essentially uh, uh, equivalent to providing a, a short distance cutoff. Uh, from that relation, OK? Is it clear? And you will use this in your p set, OK? So the second remark is that here we are considering, so in good force, we are mostly, as we said, it's a conformal theory. Or oh, it's a scale invariant theory. A feature for scale invariant theory is that there's no scale. There's no scale means you can have arbitrary low energy excitations. Okay. So for for conformal theory, say in R one comma three, there exists. Because of the scale invariance, 
there exist arbitrary low energy excitations. Okay. So from this RUV, then this corresponding to then, then this just map to the, uh, 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 the, the D equal to infinity region in the bulk, okay? Okay, so this map to the D equal to infinity region in the bulk. So it's a very good thing that there is a D equal to infinity region. Okay, it's a very good thing this is equal to infinity region because otherwise those modes ha have nothing to uh, uh, map to. So on the other hand, if the theory have a gap, on the other hand, on the other hand, if say, if the corresponding box space time The end at the finite proper distance. Oh. Okay. So the important thing is the following. So let's take any point here. Take any point here. So this is some reference scale. Uh, uh, say cho choose it as a reference scale in the in the field theory. Yeah, uh, because of the uh, because of this UVR connection. So now we want to consider the average low energy scale compared to this scale. Then what you want to do? Then you just you go to z equal to infinity. And this, what is actually hidden here, when you do this argument, is actually the proper distance going to z equal to infinity is the, is infinite. And because when you do this proper distance. Uh, 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 yeah, you think there's infinite proper distance in go to z equal to infinity, and then you can go to infinite low energy scales, okay? But now, if you look at the global ADS, then take some interior point, then actually you can easily check when you go to the the most interior point is just rho equal to zero, okay? And that is finite proper distance away. So, so in some sense, the space time ends at the finite proper distance in the radial direction, okay? In this case, if you apply this, this will tell you that the theory cannot have arbitrary low energy excitations, okay? Is this clear? Let me just say it again. In this theory, in the Poincaré patch, in the bulk, we can go to z equal to infinity, and that's infinite proper distance away. And using this UVIR argument, that's translated to the infinite low energy process in the field theory. But now let's consider what's happening in the global ADS. Just from the geometry, we see something dramatic happens. Because now, this is a cylinder, and uh, it, it, look at the metric, it takes finite distance from some point to go to, the in, to go to the most center point, which is row zero. So you no longer have infinite distance to go to. So if this argument is consistent, then, then this must be dual to a theory with not, without arbitrary low energy excitations, okay? Without arbitrary low energy excitations. But this is indeed the case, because according to what I erased just before we break, we say for the idea, for the gravity theory in the global ADS, that should be dual to a young mill theory on the boundary of here, which is S times R. For any field theory on the S, Again, this is a compact manifold. Then there's a mass gap from the vacuum. 
And, uh, and so this theory actually have a mass gap, OK? So that means if the corresponding box space time and there's some finite proper distance, the boundary theory A boundary theory must have a mass gap. And vice versa. If the field theory have a mass gap, which you cannot go to arbitrary low energies, and then the box space time have to be end somewhere. Uh, otherwise, this statement uh, will not apply. Okay, so 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 consistency check of that statement uh, is that this has to be true. Okay, so so in the P side, you should think through this for the for the for the process of the field theory on the cylinder. Okay. Okay, I think I will stop here. Uh, um, do you have any questions regarding this? Yes. Uh, I was somewhat under the impression that the global ADS and the flank right batch were just different coordinate representations of the same thing, sort of. So how was that incorrect? Hmm? Uh, I was under the impression that the global ADS and the flank right batch are just different coordinate charts on a, on the same sort of structure or mantle. Yeah. Uh, so why do we have infinite distance in one and finite distance in another? Is that um, figured out? it out. And this is the geometry. You can just uh, uh, look at them. Uh, it depends on how you slice uh, uh, the, uh, the space time. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's very easy to see. Just see how you map one point to the other point, etc. Yeah. Uh, 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 but the important thing, uh, 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 the important thing uh, uh, is that the, um, uh, this, uh, yeah, uh, I'll give you a hint. Uh, so this is equal to infinity can be considered as a coordinate singularity of that thing. So even though here it's completely smooth, but in here it's like a coordinate singularity because of this. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, so that's why uh, uh, actually uh, uh, to talk about theory on R3 and the theory on S3 is highly not true because the physics uh, are very different. Because here, uh, 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 um, yeah, because here you always have a mass gap. And, and uh, here you don't. Uh, and uh, uh, so that reflects the geometry are very different. Uh, and the way you view the geometry are very different. So the compact has five doesn't mean five manifold. Hmm? The compact is very yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. not really nice. But if you change this manifold, then it's still any force you can not be able to Yeah, it would be something else. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm.